and welcome to Grace Bible Church. It's Easter Sunday. Uh, but one thing I want us to, to really concentrate on this morning is, is what today is really all about. You know, it, it's not about rabbits. It's not about eggs or candy or even springtime. Uh, the world today and the traditions of today, that it, it, it really wants you to focus in those areas. But the truth is, is what we're celebrating today has absolutely nothing to do with any of those things. Instead, today we're celebrating an event that radically changed the course of history. You see, today is Resurrection Day. But before we get to that, let's back up a little bit. I, I want us to, to back up a few days and give or take a couple thousand years. And look at the events of this week back during Jesus' day. Um, over the course of this week, we've seen a dramatic shift take place in the city of Jerusalem. Um, last Sunday, we talked about Jesus making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, him uh, coming in and being hailed as the Messiah that the people had been waiting on. And, and so we see as he's making his, this, this entry, this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, um, the, the entry is bathed with celebration. Uh, it, it's, it's filled with shouts of joy and shouts of praise. As, as people are, are laying their, their coats down on the road and, and breaking off palm branches and, and laying them down on the road along the path that led from the Mount of Olives to the Temple Mount. And the entire time is filled with song and celebration. Since that time, over the course of the last few days, Jesus has instituted the tradition of communion with his disciples um, and then they leave the upper room and they head to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, which was uh, kind of a go-to for Jesus. This wasn't something that was unusual. He often went to the Garden to pray. Um, from here, we know that Jesus would be arrested and taken to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. Uh, this would have been early, early in the morning, uh, before sunrise, before the sun even came up. And and this would have taken place on, on Friday. It's a day that, that today we refer to as, as Good Friday, uh, which we celebrated just a, a couple of days ago. Uh, but that fateful Friday morning, Jesus is arrested and, and then brought before the Jewish leaders. And, and he's put on trial. And, and the thing is, is this trial that Jesus is put on, it, it was a sham from the beginning. It was filled with false witnesses and false testimony accusing Jesus of things. Um, but not only was it a sham in that regard, but everything that they did leading up to this trial broke their own laws. When you go back and you look at the, 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 the Jewish laws and customs governing something like this, a trial like this, number one, Jesus never should have been arrested at night. That was illegal according to their own laws. He should not have been bound whenever he was arrested. That was against their own laws. It was against the law to bind an uncondemned man. So their arresting of Jesus was against their laws. Then it was held in a private residence. It wasn't a public hearing. Therefore, there, were, there wasn't the opportunity for people to come and to give testimony and to defend Jesus. Then on top of that, it was held at night. No trial like this was ever to be held at night. It was to be held in the middle of the day when everybody had an opportunity to come. So all throughout this event, they were breaking their own laws in order to condemn Jesus. This mockery of a trial was followed by a trip to Antonio's fortress, which lay just outside of the walls of the Temple Mount. Um, Jesus would then be handed off to King Herod after Pilate didn't want to deal with 
condemning this man. But Herod wouldn't do it either, so he was sent back to Pilate. So after being beaten and whipped in order to try to appease the people and appease the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, um, Pilate ends up offering the people a choice. He offers them the choice of Jesus, who was a man who had done great things for the people, who had healed the people, who had raised the dead, who had fed the hungry, the one who the people claimed to be the Messiah, or Barabbas. Barabbas was a murderer and a rebel. He wasn't a very good man. And yet the religious leaders talked the people into choosing Barabbas. Well, this forced Pilate's hand. And so Pilate had to choose whether or not he would give in to the demands of the Jewish leaders. And so he does. And he sends Jesus off to be crucified. Now, most of us probably know about these events. Most of us could probably even put all of them in the correct order of, with, uh, of, of how they happened. But how real are these events to us? In our own minds, how real are they? You know, so often we look at Scripture and we regard Scripture the same way that we regard fairy tales. We have the same mindset of, of when we read about the things that happened in Scripture as we do when we read about Snow White or Hercules or Cinderella. Now, they're good stories, but they aren't actually real. And sadly, many people look at Scripture the same way. Now, truth is, most of us probably wouldn't actually admit that that's what we do. But seriously, in your own mind, just how serious do you take these stories? These stories. But you see, these weren't just stories. These are accounts of the lives of real people. People who had real lives and real problems. So how deeply involved have you gotten with these people? Or are they just characters in a story? What about the most important character? What about Jesus? How deep have you really thought about what he was going through? What had to be going through his mind during all of this? Because you see, he's still God. We can't forget that. As we read about him in scripture, after he takes the form of man, yes, he is all man, but at the same time, he is still all God. So he knew what was going to happen. He knew that, that Peter would deny him. He knew that, that Judas would betray him. He knew all of these things before they happened. He also knew what was coming. He knew what his creation was going to do to him. He knew how much it was going to hurt. He knew how bad it was going to be. He knew. And that's why he went to the garden to pray. And I really think that it's here we begin to get a small glimpse into the, the mindset of Jesus. We really begin to get a, the opportunity to understand what was going through his mind as he prepares to face the next 24 hours. Three separate times, three separate times, he goes off by himself and prays the same prayer for an hour. Now, I'm not gonna ask when's the last time any of us have prayed for an hour, much less when's the last time that any of us spent an hour praying over the same Thing. But yet 
That's exactly what Jesus did. He spent three hours sp saying and praying the same prayer over and over again. We find that in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 14, verses 33 through 36. It says, and he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell on the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things, all things are possible. All things are possible with you. If it is possible, excuse me, and he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. I have a little bit of technical difficulties. I apologize. Jesus said, you begin to get a small thing possible with you. If it be possible, remove this cup from me. Three separate times he prayed this prayer. Three separate times for an hour he prayed this same prayer. Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Luke, being a doctor, brings out another piece of information that's not recorded in the other Gospels. In Luke chapter 22, verse 44, it tells us, And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. You know, you can look it up. This is actually a, a, a condition that's referred to and I'll probably butcher it because I'm not in the medical field, but it's hematidrosis. And it, it happens when the blood vessels that, that feed the sweat glands rupture. Um, this rupture causes blood to begin to ooze from the skin uh, and, and really would mimic sweating, except instead of sweat, it's, it's drops of blood that's coming and oozing out of the skin. And according to what I've been able to find on it, it says that this can occur under conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress. So this condition, along with Jesus's prayer, should give us a little bit of insight into exactly where the mindset of Jesus was. These next few hours weren't something that he was taking lightly. It wasn't a prayer that, that he was praying flippantly. Instead, he was praying earnestly because he knew what he was going to be facing. He knew how unpleasant it was going to be. So I don't, I don't think as we read through this and we read this prayer that, that Jesus prays, that, that it's a prayer that he just said. I think there was some earnestness here. I don't think it was something that, that he said lightheartedly, like, God, if, if there's another way, you know, let, let's, let's do this some other way. I don't, I don't think that's the way he prayed at all. I mean, when you listen to the words, when you look at what he said and to think about the hours he spent praying this, it's Abba, Father, Daddy, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, Daddy, this is going to hurt. 
Daddy, so if there's any other way, Daddy, I, I really don't want to have to go through this. So, Daddy, if there's any other way, let's do it the other way. I don't think it was a prayer he took lightly. I don't think it was something that, that he was really looking forward to. So the Bible says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And I believe the joy that was set before him was the thought of being with us for eternity. The thought of being able to redeem his creation, to be able to redeem his children. That was the joy that was set before him. It wasn't the cross. It was the work of the cross. Because judging by his prayer here, it doesn't look like the cross was something he was looking forward to. Yet he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You know, some even believe that Jesus wasn't going to feel the pain of the crucifixion. That, that he would somehow, because he is God, just shut off the pain receptors in his body. But if that were the case, then what would have been the purpose of him praying so earnestly and being in such a state of stress that that the blood vessels in his skin would burst and cause him to sweat blood. If that were the case, what would have been the point of all of that? But instead, being all God and all man, I, I can't help but believe that he knew what he was going to be facing and he was going to feel every last bit of it. He knew what they were going to do to him, his creation, what they were going to do to him. He knew that they would slap him. He knew that they would beat him, that they would, they would rip his beard out of his face. The very people he created and that he loved. He knew what it was going to feel like to have the rods beat against his back. He knew what it was going to feel like to have the cat of nine tails strip the flesh from his body. He knew about the robe and the crown of thorns. He knew about the weight of the cross on his bleeding shoulders. He knew about the spikes being driven into his wrists and his feet. He knew what it was going to feel like when the cross was dropped into the hole. He knew. He knew. He knew that the soldiers would use him to play a game. That he, they, they would use him to play the game of the king. And for those of you who, who don't know about that, it was, it was a brutal game game that was played by members of the Roman Legion. Originally, it would be played by selecting a new young recruit. And they would dress him up as a king and the, the soldiers would take turns casting lots to take away everything from the king. They would take his crown, they would take his wife, they would take his scepter, his home back in Rome, his robe, they would take everything that he had away from him. And once they had taken away everything that he had, they would cast lots to see who got to kill him. Eventually, laws were passed forbidding them from playing the game and killing another soldier. So they would then turn to using slaves and prisoners to play out their game instead. When we understand that, we can better understand why they did some of the things that they did. We can understand why they would dress him up in a robe with a crown and a scepter. We can understand why they would bow down before him and, and worship him mockingly while all the while beating and abusing him. Why they would strip the robe off before having him carry his cross. Why we would do all of these things and so much more. 
These soldiers were playing a game with Jesus. They were using Jesus to simply play a game. It, it's almost hard to fathom, to really understand that these men were playing a game with God. And they didn't even realize it. And you know, it's sad to say, but sometimes we as believers can do the same thing. We too can play games with God because we don't take seriously the things that he's told us. We don't take seriously the commandments that he's issued to us. So we play games with him too. We forget he's God. And I really think the craziest thing about the whole situation is the fact that Jesus could have stopped it. At any time, he could have ended it. He could have ended the pain. He could have ended all the shame, all of the abuse, all of the suffering. He could have stopped it all. He could have stopped it. He was God. But he didn't. He could have stopped it when the temple guards arrested him. He could have stopped it when they bound and beat him. But he didn't. He could have stopped it when the people started bringing false accusations against him. He could have stopped it. He could have stopped it when Herod and Pilate questioned his kingdom and his authority. He could have shut them down. He could have pinched their airway off. He could have stopped it all, but he didn't. He could have stopped it when they beat him with rods. He could have stopped it when they whipped him with the cat of nine tails. He could have stopped it when they put the crown of thorns on his head. He could have stopped it when the soldiers started mocking and beating him. He could have stopped it as he walked down the Via Della Rosa carrying his cross. He could have stopped it when they decided to drive the first nail. He could have stopped it when they raised the cross. He could have stopped it when the Pharisees continued mocking him as he hung there, dying to save them. He could have stopped it all. But he didn't. Do you remember what he told Peter at the garden when they came to arrest him? Matthew chapter 26, verses 51 through 54. says, and behold, one of those who were with Jesus, who we know from the other gospels was Peter, reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all of those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will send at once and put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. How then will the scriptures be fulfilled which say that it must happen this way? Jesus said, all I have to do is ask and my father will give me 12 legions of angels. Just for those who like math, a legion was between seven and 10,000 men. So we're talking at least a minimum of 84 to 120,000 angels at his beck and call. And then to think in 2 Kings chapter 19, over the course of just a few hours, one angel 
killed 185,000 soldiers. Imagine what 100,000 of them could do. I can't help but imagine every one of them begging, just begging for permission to go. These heavenly beings that had been with the Father and with the Son for ages, worshiping and praising and serving. And here they are watching as the very ones that were created by God abuse him. I, I can't even imagine the anger that they must have felt as they watched with every slap and every punch, every lash and every insult and every drop of his precious blood that was spilled and they sit there and they just beg Jesus, just say the word. Just let us go. Come on, Jesus, they, they, they can't treat you like this. Let us, let us take care of them, Jesus. We'll take care of them. And they just beg for permission. But they never got it. Matthew chapter 26, verse 54. If you remember, Jesus told Peter, How then will the scriptures be fulfilled which say it must happen this way? It must happen this way. You see, this was the only way. Is that the answer that he received from his father when he prayed in the garden? I mean, he prayed and begged his, his dad, Daddy, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But the cup didn't pass, which tells us there was no other way. This was the only way. There was no other way that we could be redeemed. There was no other way that we could be saved. You see, you can't earn salvation. You can't work for it. You can't be good enough for it. You can't be saved by any other way but through faith in Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody gets to the Father but through me. There is no other way. Which brings us to the cross. While hanging there, suspended between heaven and earth, the soldiers and the religious leaders continue to mock him. Even as he prayed that God would forgive them for what they were doing, they continued to to mock him. Then as the sin of the world is placed upon him, Jesus cries out. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But this saying also points to something else. You see, the Jews by this time had a written language. And so the scriptures had been transcribed and had been written down, but they were still deeply founded in the oral tradition. You see, at an early age, they would begin to be taught to memorize scripture, including the book of Psalms. I want us to look at Psalm 22. And, and let's, let's look and see if there's anything here that, that jumps out at us. Verse 1. My God, my God, 
why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that the exact same thing that Jesus just said on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was he quoting from Psalm chapter 22? Let's continue on. Let's look at verses 7 and 8. All those, all who see me, sneer at me. They separate with the lip and they wag their heads saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Turn now to Matthew chapter 27. And let's look again at what happened there as Jesus is on the cross. Matthew chapter 27 verses uh, 39 through 43. It says, and those passing by were hurling abuse at him wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross that we may believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. A lot of similarities here, isn't it? Back to the book of Psalms, Psalms 22, 14 through 18. Verse 14 says, I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. The stretching of tendons and the dislocating of joints would have been a common condition of someone who was being crucified. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like potsherd and my tongue cleaves to my jaws and you lay me in the dust of death. My tongue clings to my jaws. One of the things Jesus said on the cross was I thirst. Verse 16, for dogs have surrounded me a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. Crucifixion had not even been invented when David wrote this song. In fact, we're looking at a separation of nearly a thousand years from the time that David wrote this psalm till the Romans invented crucifixion. Verse 17, I count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. I count all my bones. None of Jesus' bones were broken. Unlike the two men who were crucified alongside him, whose legs were broken in order to have them die faster so they would not be on the cross during the Passover celebration. Jesus didn't have that happen. Verse 18. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Those of us who've read the account know that as Jesus hung on the cross, the soldiers at his feet were gambling, casting lots for his clothing. 
Psalm chapter 22 is a prophetic description of the cross. And the thing is, is it's one that every Jew would have been able to recognize if they were willing to look. It, it wouldn't be much different than, than me saying, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Just about everybody who's listening to this now can finish the rest of that. I don't have to say the rest of it for you to know what I'm talking about. You know exactly the words that follow. In the same way, when Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every Jew would have known the rest of the psalm. And if they were willing to look, would recognize the similarity between the psalm of David written a thousand years before and what was taking place before their very eyes. John chapter 19, verse 30. It says, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit it is finished I can't imagine that this was something that he said lightly instead I truly believe that this was a shout of victory and a shout of triumph from the cross. I can't help but think it was more like, it is finished. The work was done. The suffering was through. He had accomplished the task that he was set before him. It was finished the cost of redemption had been paid it is finished we had the opportunity to be redeemed but the story doesn't end there It would have been amazing if it had. It still would have been amazing. Salvation had come. The exact same thing that the people had been singing about just five days earlier as Jesus made his way into Jerusalem. Salvation had come. Jesus had paid the debt of sin for the entire world. But luckily for us, the story doesn't end there. There's still more to come. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus come and take Jesus' body and prepare him for burial. And there his body stayed that Friday night, all day Saturday. Oh, but then came Sunday morning. Then came Easter morning. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 7 recorded. It says, Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone that sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook in fear of him and became as dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, 
For I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. For he has risen, just as he said, come, see the place where he was laying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So everything changed. Not only are we offered forgiveness of our sins, but we're also offered hope. And it's not, it's not a hope like, I hope something will happen. That, that's not the hope that we have. Instead, it's a hope that comes from assurance of what we know will happen. Not what we hope may happen, but things that we know will happen. That's the hope that we've been given. A hope in the knowledge that our God is able to rise us up from the dead, just as he did Jesus. That, that death isn't the end. That there's more to come after death. We don't have to be afraid. You see, that's what Easter's really all about. It's not about the eggs or the rabbit. It's not about any of that stuff. Easter's about hope. It's about the hope that we received when Jesus was raised from the dead. So today, I know most of you are celebrating this Easter Sunday at home. Some with your immediate family, some of you may even be forced to celebrate it alone. Celebrate anyway. Celebrate anyway. Because we have something worth celebrating. Many religions today, they worship gods that are dead and buried. They can go to where their gods are buried and they can worship them there at their tombs. We can't do that because our God is alive. He's not still sitting in some tomb. He's not rotting away. He is alive for he has risen just as he said he would. Our God's alive. And that, my friends, is why we celebrate. That is why we should today, even in the midst of everything else that's going on, why today we should still celebrate. So happy Easter, everybody. Happy Resurrection Day. I love you. Can't wait to be with you again soon.